<coughs> thank you rutul and thank you the entire team of uh, i didn't know that this is the fifth year of your meeting congratulations for this uh, hyperlessy men pregnancy group uh, my regards to professor sheshaya uh, i have to talk on pregnancy and diabetes gdm some myths and facts i don't have any duality or conflict of interest for this talk <coughs> i'm going to talk on two uh, uh, central themes and messages before i go to myths and facts because we need to understand biology better and uh, you know you had some free paper so i thought there would not be any audience but uh, we need to understand that when there is mammalian embryogenesis there is a lot of metabolic plasticity and whenever there are metabolic processes uh, these are not passive bystanders for a developmental program laid down by other biological phenomenon in fact metabolism is a direct and active participant that helps to set developmental programs so whatever we develop from in utero to adulthood is actually a very active process and which is why you know the the whole dipsy movement which professor sheshaya lead and now i congratulate utul for leading this hip movement is is very crucial for development so therefore when we understand biology early loss of pregnancy birth defects diabetes aging <clears throat> we need to understand that there are defects in metabolic plasticity or redox status because its body's redox status which is altered or and it could be stress induced and it could be either a facilitator or a contributor so when we look at this whole cell development paper in 2021 and we look at normal homeostasis uh, you know we know that normal homeostasis and all the pre implantation embryos they follow a very stereotypic pattern from a zygote to blastocyst and you know there is reductive rigidity versus metabolic plasticity and all that is determined by three crucial uh, parts of metabolic plasticity the pyruvate lactate axis the glucose axis and the fatty acids and it's fundamentally the redox shuttles and the ldbhb activity and the reduced redox state and the oxidized redox state which will drive this whole response so clearly in the early embryonic metabolism when the embryo is very young is very rigid and the nutrient requirements are very sensitive to reductive stress and there is a mark disequilibrium in two halves of the tca cycle and later on the loss of the maternal ldhb and transcription of the zygotic products they favor the activity of bioenergetic shuttles fatty acid oxidation and equilibrium of the tca cycle and as the metabolic plasticity peaks the blastocyst then can develop without external nutrients so therefore for the normal developmental metabolism of early embryo it is very distinct for example from cancer metabolism and therefore when we look on the new data coming up on reductive stress we clearly recognize that the metabolic plasticity is increased with maturation and due to changes in redox control mechanisms and that leads to the transcriptional reprogram in late stage embryos and therefore it is probably a part of a homeostatic phenomenon or an adaptation to environmental changes <clears throat> so i actually published this article couple of days back on a november cell paper which is a fetal atlas and this fetal atlas is atlas of fetal metabolism during mid and late gestation and diabetic pregnancy and this pel paper is what i am going to discuss what they looked at is the maternal glycemic state and impact on fetal tissues they looked at stage specific metabolic changes and they looked at the maternal and fetal nutrient sourcing and they actually had animal models of this using a glucose infusion in mice and they had two types of mice just like you have for uh, studying insulin resistance now the gdm models or the pregnancy and diabetes models are based on two types of mice the wild type mice which is the euglycemic mice and the akita mice which is the hyperglycemic mice so when we study insulin resistance which is central to type 2 diabetes those are euglycemic clamps and hyperglycemic clamps 
Similarly, when we are studying the impact of fetal metabolism, we study euglycemic wild type mice and hyperglycemic akita mice. And we look at their impact on the brain, the liver, the placenta and the heart of the fetal tissue and the maternal plasma. And we can study the impact of maternal glycemic state on fetal tissue. We can study each stage of the fetus and we can study the interaction between maternal and fetal nutrient sensing. So this atlas is published now. I would urge each one of you to read the full text of this article. And it clearly tells us the atlas of fetal metabolism in mid and late gestation and diabetic pregnancy. And there is a mounting evidence to show that metabolism instructs stem cell fate decisions. And it tells you how fetal metabolism changes during development and how altered maternal metabolism shapes the future of fetal metabolism. So this is what it does because now we have techniques. We have radioisotopic techniques like the C13 glucose and the LCMS which is liquid chromatography and they have profiled in this study and Ramirez et al have profiled fetal brains, fetal hearts, fetal livers, fetal placentas which are harvested from pregnant glucose dams during embryonic days and therefore this entire analysis actually reveals a state of hyperglycemic environment and various signatures which tell us developmental transition during euglycemic development. And what did they observe? They observed that sorbitol accumulates in fetal tissues and that alters the neurotransmitter in fetal brains from these glucose dams as they call it or hyperglycemic dams. And using these tracers which are extremely safe, they look at the dispartiate or the discordance between fetal nutrient sourcing on glycemic status. And another important thing from this study which we reveals is independent of the glucose state, independent of the glucose state, the histine derived metabolites are accumulated in the late stage fetal tissues. So many a times we know that a woman might be very well controlled in gestation in the third trimester. She may not even have a single glucose peak and she may have an intrauterine fetal death or come out with a congenital malformation. While someone may be having an A1C of 11 and might have a normal baby. And that mechanism is understood from this fetal atlas that it is actually the histine derived metabolites in the late stage of the fetal tissue which actually determines the outcome. So not all outcomes are only related to glucose control. Some outcomes are related to glucose control, some outcomes are not related to glucose control. That's the second take home message which comes in. So we have recognized two things which are inseparable, maternal nutrition and fetal development. I think that is extremely well documented across the world, whether it is from UK, from India, all over. And we clearly know that dietary intervention during pregnancy promote maternal health, reduce incidence of fetal developmental defects. And clearly there is an impact of iron supplements and IUGR during pregnancy. <clears throat> and therefore the iron shakti movement of government of India and Prime Minister Modi is very, very relevant. And we clearly recognize the need for folic acid supplementation on fetal neural tube defects. So these are two documented phenomena. However, what we need to do from this 10th of March of 2024, which is Dr. Sheshaya's birthday, which is Gestational Diabetes Day in India, is how fetal metabolism shapes during development and how the prevalent clinical conditions affect maternal metabolism impacting fetus. Because we clearly are seeing a second peak between 15 and 30 of type 2 diabetes in India. <clears throat> Whether that peak is altering the GDM population, we don't know. But this atlas gave us some insights on the metabolic plasticity, both on the pre-implantation embryo and each compartment on the embryonic days. And clearly also on the mid and late gestation and the fetal impact. And we all know that maternal diabetes is a growing clinical problem in India and worldwide. We clearly see an adverse trend of increased incidence of gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes in the younger patients prior to pregnancy. And we clearly see that maternal hyperglycemia has a fourfold increased risk of congenital heart disease and neurodevelopmental defects. So this data is clear cut. So this study clearly tells us a very extensive metabolic atlas of fetal tissues and gives us metabolic level dynamics and 
pathways of utilization from a euglycemic model and a hyperglycemic model. And this very rich data set reveals metabolic signatures <coughs> which studies impact of high glucose exposure in utero on fetal tissue metabolism. And you can leverage this atlas to design strategies to meet nutritional needs of fetus and salvage it. <coughs> so this was the study. This is a metabolic platform assessing fetal metabolism during mid and late gestation of diabetic pregnancy. This was the maternal hyperglycemic Akita mice model. So these are pregnant Akita mice. This is an experimental setup using a very high quality data set for three analytes, developmental stage, fetal tissue origin and maternal glycemic state. And all it concludes is maternal hyperglycemia causes sorbitol to accumulate in fetal tissue. So I think this is a recognized and this is evidence based for that. Then this is looking at both the mice, the wild type mice and the Akita mice of the glucose dams in euglycemic and hyperglycemic states. And they look at the metabolic signatures on maternal plasma and each fetal tissue. Look at the glycemic state, the embryonic day and the interaction at placental level, heart level, liver level, brain level and maternal plasma. <coughs> and then this sorbitol accumulation in the fetal tissues, this is a heat map. And you can see in this heat map, the log fold changes of the glycolytic pathways and the polyol pathways in the fetal tissues. And clearly you can see that there is a sorbitol pool. So there is a clear sorbitol pool which is recognized and universally seen. The other thing which occurs during mid and late gestation, it is not just sorbitol and glucose. The maternal hyperglycemia alters aspartate and glutamate levels in fetal brains. And it is very important to recognize the role of aspartate and glutamate levels in fetal grains. And you can actually measure from this atlas, you can see, you can measure GABA in fetal tissues. And the lower levels of neurotransmitters probably contribute to higher incidence of congenital brain defects in fetus exposed to maternal hyperglycemia. So we actually have now labeling based on various CLAM studies to understand this biology better. And based on isotope tracing of fetal tissues, you can see how in fetal nutrient sourcing and utilization is studied. And clearly you can see that you can have the entire metabolic strategy and you can actually define a metabolic strategy based on that. And what is also unique is that the de novo nucleotide synthesis during fetal development drastically drops down. And as I told you, in late stage, independent of glycemic status, there is an accumulation of histidine derived metabolites and they have a relationship. So what are the insights from this take homes from this atlas study? That the glucose dams which they created and the sorbitol pathways they created, this relative pool of fetal tissues, the glucose derived toxic metabolite sorbitol in all fetal tissues, clearly you know you can't shield the fetal tissue from sorbitol accumulation. And clearly we recognize that uncontrolled hyperglycemia leads to sorbitol accumulation and tissue damage in insulin independent tissues like retina, kidney and nerves. Clearly we have good research to show that sorbitol accumulates in rat fetal livers, placentas and as well as neuroectodermal tissues. And very clearly we know the temporal change of abundance of concentration of sorbitol across gestational data and therefore we need to study that better. So the lesson learned from this fetal atlas is we are getting better hypothesis to test to understand mechanistic insights in connecting metabolism to cell fate transitions. And clearly we can recognize that in diabetic pregnancy, the various metabolites which are elevated in fetal tissues increase congenital defects and the sharp metabolic fluctuations delineate important developmental transitions. And therefore we still need to study more the maternal metabolism on fetal metabolism and I urge all the young group in this audience to study that better. So we all know gestational diabetes is nothing but insulin resistance with a chronic beta cell dysfunction uh, seen in pregnancy in women. And clearly we know that the changes in insulin sensitivity are similar in both groups of pregnancy. And therefore my last part 
of my talk is going to be demystifying some myths. We all know that all these factors and Dr. Sheshaya has pioneered work cause GDM. We know it's nothing but beta cell deterioration, blunting of first wave of insulin release, insulin resistance and it all starts in second trimester. And clearly we know all the fetal malformations. Then we clearly know the anabolic and catabolic pathways. I remember Professor Sheshaya a long time back, almost 20 years back told me to talk on this topic on the metabolism in pregnancy. The first half is anabolic, the second half is catabolic and we clearly recognize that in the catabolic half the placental hormones block glucose receptors, they increase lipolysis, increase gluconeogenesis, decrease glycogenesis and fundamentally the glucose and amino acid loading happens on the fetus when we understand it better. We have so many guidelines but we clearly recognize the need for screening these guidelines and we have seen how work with DIPSI has made a change. The AD had it, WHO had it, IDSPG had it, ACOG had it and we had clear cut cutoffs now. Jan 2024 ACOG, ADA came out to have a fasting 1 hour and 2 hour cut point. These are just got out a couple of days back. Bansi sent it to everybody on the groups and we all know the target. 90, <coughs> 120 are the targets but these keep changing. So the current targets are 95, 141 hour, 122 hours and these glycemic targets need to be population based and we really need to change it. So there is a need to dispel myths, particularly among patients. This was the science part of it to the entire audience but I think each one of you also is a educationist here. I can see Chandrakant here, he does a lot of social media campaigns. We need to enhance patient understanding to clear misconceptions. Because for informed decision making, we need to do myth dispelling and I would urge both Rutul and Professor Sheshaya's group to do a lot of myth dispelling. So that's the second theme of my talk is to encourage all of you all that we need to do a, and we need to give accurate information <coughs> to lessen the undue worries of GDM effects. <coughs> and we need to ensure that knowledgeable patients should follow beneficial lifestyle changes. <clears throat> and we need to empower patients to actively participate in their healthcare and support family and community awareness program. And I would urge Bansi also who is there, Sabarda, Rajiv, everybody to encourage people to broaden the impact. <clears throat> because you know there are so many myths like gestational diabetes is caused by eating sweets and sugars. We all know that's not true. We need to tell them gestational diabetes can occur during the following factors. <clears throat> it's being overweight before pregnancy, weight increased quickly during pregnancy, age about 25. Women with diabetes can be risky to the fetus. We need to tell people that tight glycemic control, the survival rates of pregnancy are identical. And if you have euglycemia throughout pregnancy, there is no likelihood of harm. The third myth is very commonly prevalent still despite of so much of education that gestational diabetes is not a serious disease. It is an extremely serious disease. And I think it's important that, you know, as, 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 a, as a public health movement, we need to do that and we need to recognize that. The next myth is pregnant woman will have to take insulin if she is diagnosed with GDM. Not true. 90% can be done by good MNT and lifestyle alone. It's only those 10% which need insulin. So it's very important to recognize that factor. Insulin is also what our portal vein has. It's, it's something which we just can't give orally. The final thing is gestational diabetes is permanent. It's not permanent but it's an interventional factor. <clears throat> it can lead to a second peak but I think it's not permanent. Gestational diabetes runs in families. Hereditary is important factor. <clears throat> but it's not necessary that if you have a family history you will get gestational diabetes. You need to follow lifestyle patterns. And finally, gestational diabetes affects only overweight people. That's not true either. Lean people affect as much as this. So I think the second message which I want to give everybody is that we need to do good science and biology, but we need to do myth busting. And we need to give good take home messages. Accurate information is the key. So I urge Rutul, whatever are the proceeds of this meeting, convert them into public health messages. Take help from people like Chandrakant, Bansi, you know, everybody, Rajiv, and ensure that accurate information 
and counter myths with evidence based facts tailor diabetes man management to individual patient needs patient centered approach regular monitoring and adjustment multidisciplinary team we are across branches here and empower people with education and ongoing support gdm is a public health issue because me and rajiv were debating the guess estimate in india is 4 to 8 million he thinks it's 6 million okay at any given point of time i feel it could even be 10 million we we don't know the true figures gdm clearly impacts both maternal and neonatal outcomes and the mother and the baby and and we need to recognize it better we all know all the complications we should be concerned about gdm because we clearly recognize that children of mothers with uncontrolled diabetes either pre existing or originating during pregnancy are 4 to 8 times more likely to develop diabetes in later life compared to siblings born of same parents with normal glycemia so it's a very important thing intervention is equally important and i think we have to congratulate dr shesha and many others in the audience for setting standards to define this disease in india you know dipsy criteria gain traction due to ease of non fasting testing and that is really showing the the trend uh, but but we also need to recognize that we don't want to misclassify gdm so we need to do evidence based research to prove what is prove the facts we need to do sensitivity and specificity analysis we need to prove how it passes the test of time for a screen tool it's perfect for using it for day to day we need to do more research what can be done crucial to define when to treat not just based on clinical practice but we need to facilitate public policy and we definitely need to do lot of outcome based studies from multi center so i think that's the other thing which rutul and the group can do with bansi dr sheshaya rajiv everybody samarda we definitely need to do have a pragmatic view we need to intervene we need to hit two or three generations and the societal awareness in gdm is very very low priority in the health healthcare system this case study of jagran pehal from wdf is a very good example of, of gdm awareness I, i congratulate them they did a very good campaign on new delhi punjab and bihar making gdm screening mandatory for public health facilities but i think we i have to look at maternal diabetes and gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes with a multifaceted approach we need to do more outcomes data and we need to do more cost effectiveness of diagnostic criteria raise the societal awareness build some science around it advocate policy makers to mandate the testing a lot of it has already happened but unfortunately the central policies are state dependent because execution happens to the state governments and i think all these initiatives need to be encouraged i just wanted to you know incite some provocative and thought stimulating science and public health thoughts through my dialogue and discussion thank you so much for the opportunity